Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another session of Hashtag Gather to Grow here on Food from Zanzi's Twitter Spaces. I'm your host, Dawn Umdu, and tonight we're talking about maize, growing maize, and also some advice when it comes to pest management. I'm going to start with the female farmer in the house. Canela, maybe just an introduction where you start in agriculture. All I can see is your beautiful, pretty picture. Please do tell us about who is this woman in the agricultural space that's really thriving and making the most of it. I am Kinelwe Neora Pesu. I am a farmer based in Khojan province. I farm with maize. I also farm with soya bean, cattle and pigs. I started farming when I was 18 with my father and I took over the operations when I was 21. Absolutely amazing. I think there was this one story that we did of Tabo Titahoe. I think he sort of dubbed himself the youngest farmer in Mzanzi. And you started at 18, which I think is a little bit younger than when he started. I'm not sure. But anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for being here, Kanela. It's absolutely a pleasure to have you on the space. This guy is knowledgeable on many commodities. And tonight he joins us again um, to talk about maize. Clifford, welcome back to Twitter Spaces and you're on hashtag Gather to Grow. Maybe just for those who might not know you a bit about yourself and your journey in agriculture. Hello, everyone. I'm Clifford Mtimkulu from Sototo Municipality, Tabumu Futsanyanu District, in the small town called Senegal. Been farming for the rest of my life. Last time you said I'm a multiple award winner, hard worker, determined, passionate about farming. If anything wakes me up, it's farming. Definitely. I actually read uh, one of it from Zanzi's recent articles saying that, you know, farming is one of the toughest professions to be in. And you wake up every day to do it. So hats off to you and congratulations on one of your recent awards as well. My resident economist, agricultural economist, Tabilene Konjana is from the Agricultural Research Council. Tabile, just an introduction of you, you know, people who might not know who you are. I usually like to have him join us just to give us a broader perspective and not just focus on the hands-on farming aspects, but also just to give us some perspective of what's happening in South Africa, but also Africa and internationally. So Tabile, thank you so much for being here. My name is Tabile Ngunjana. I am an agricultural economist with the National Agricultural Marketing Council. I've been blessed enough to be within the industry that is doing well in terms of feeding people in South Africa, continent and the world at large. And thanks for having me today. Thank you so much, Tabile. And then this guy I met recently, Tabo, um, it's so great to have you with me. And when I first heard your journey in agriculture, I was really amazed because actually, guys, he's a miner and he farms. I was like, what? Are you telling me that you do that by day and you farm, you know, as well? So maybe just your story, what makes you attracted to the sector and how you do it? I'm a platinum miner by career. I'm a farmer by colleague. I'm a third generation farmer from my family, where if I might take it back, everybody knows the form of the Putatswana era. Each and every family from my village was allocated a certain hectare, so where that's where everyone was. I was born and bred in a village, so I call myself a village farmer. So my idea behind all of this thing is to just ensure that I play part in the food production of Africa because there's so much that we can offer. I'm a passionate farmer. I do everything that involves farming. But for today, I'm just going to cut it short. Just like I'm a crop farmer for now. Probably in some few years, you'll hear about me doing big business with North NWK and Obaru. That's my idea. Thank you so much. I love that for you and all the blessings with your future plans as well. Now, as I mentioned, our topic is maize and maize is a major summer crop produced in Mzanzi. White maize is one of our main dietary staples and yellow maize is a primary energy source in feed rations used for poultry and dairy production. Maybe let's start with a C, kind of an overview of the 2022-2023 harvest. Tabile, maybe you can just set the scene for us as your take as an agricultural economist in the space. We are in mid of our maize 2022-2023 season. We are doing extremely well in terms of our exports. So this year, we are expected at least to have something like around at least 15 million tons of maize, both yellow and white. So, so far, we have been exporting, of course, to our normally our traditional markets, mainly in Asia for now. As of the 30th of September, we have exported at least 1.79 million, which is one, close to 1.8 million, and that is lesser to the three, at least the 3.5 million we are anticipated to export this year. 
So I think we are doing very well with that. And also, given the relatively okay uh, numbers in terms of maize, it's not that bad. But of course, I mean, we have issues with inputs. The farmers will not be being hit as so bad, but things could have been better. Of course, we are exporting to our African countries, your Zimbabwe, your mainly Lesotho, Namibia. We are also sending a lot of our maize even now to Seychelles, the country that is somewhere in the middle of the sea. So we are doing extremely well with that. So also given that the market entirely now, here is such a situation where it's very uncertain. Farmers are yeah, going to be skeptical sometimes, but I think for now, it is relatively okay. And actually, I think I've recently seen that even there's a possibility now that we can even send our maize to Kenya, a car that has banned uh, GMOs for the past 12 years, I think. There is, a, I think, pretty much a good future in terms of the farmers within the maize, in terms of their exports. And of course, the market for now is still relatively good, even though, as I mentioned earlier, that we have issues with input cost. But I think, yes, we are almost there. Of course, mostly we're sending our white maize to this. In fact, even Italy is buying a lot of our white maize recently. So, I mean, South Africa is producing a relatively good quality. That, of course, it speaks for us in terms of the market. So 2022-2023 season, again, is promising to be a relatively good season. But of course, we have a bit of lower quantity compared to what we had last season, but it's not that bad. I think we're going to have a very good season this time around. Thanks, Dabile. And I would definitely like to hear from our farmers as well in terms of what the experience has been thus far with this commodity in terms of the issues that they're dealing with in terms of the rising input costs, but also just how the market has changed for them and how they've been affected by various things for the past year and specifically, you know, the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. Now, most of South Africa's maize is produced in the summer rainfall areas with the free state usually accounting for half of the total volumes produced. And I think that is where Clifford is also based. And obviously, all of this depends on the climatic conditions. And then there's also the Northwest and in Bumalanga. Now, maybe my next question, just for some more context, would be to ask the farmers how, you know, changing climatic conditions due to climate change has impacted the way they're producing in these regions specifically. Clifford, do you maybe want to kick off and then just share your experience as someone that has been producing this crop for a while? Um, and how has climate change really affected you and your crop, or specifically this season? We had quite a difficult season. The prices was good, but the rain, the La Nina got us. And then we ended up not being even able to put the post image a heavy side. We ended up having an overhead of using drones the latest technology in agriculture to spray our fields. Like in a week, at my other farm, I had something like 780 mils of rain. The crops were suffocating from rain, but that's why I always encourage farmers to spread wings, diversify, not planting one farm. My other farms assisted the other farm that suffocated a lot. We had to now do everything with drones, like your post image, our top dressing, even you won't believe I've never in my entire life in the farming career harvested and still get stuck in the field because it's too wet. I've never in my entire career been farming from 2009. I never saw this kind of a season. And like you saw on Farmers Weekly, we're still having the same season this year. But May is, is doing very good this season. The price we are sitting Two days ago, we had 5.1 price per ton for next day on futures. Uh, input cost increased, but then we're still hopeful. The best crop this season is still maize. I'll encourage most of the farmers to plant maize because when you look, most of us, people are going to soya because of the input cost is low and everything. Never in my life again have the soya seed been out of stock, but people are struggling to get the soya seed. And if we have too much of anything, then the price go low. Most of the people are focusing on spending less and getting money. But then for me, it's a high input cost on the maize. But I'll do most of the maize this season because we're going to do a lot of export. Maize is going to be in a need because nobody's going to want to plant maize because of the input cost. Thanks, Clifford. And that's a good point. And I hope that people are making notes of that. But I think it's also interesting your experience and what you're saying specifically when harvesting. Kenelwe, what has your experience been like specifically for the 2022-2023 season? 
This season, I think for me was the most difficult. I didn't even manage to plant the whole 200 hectares of maize because some hectares we used for soya bean because of the excessive rain that we received. I don't struggle from pests. Mostly it's just your guinea pigs, your meerkats and so forth. With the type of rain that we received, I harvested, I think, beginning of August this year. When I went to the market, mostly I harvested plus minus seven tanks per hectare. This season, I harvested four, which was a bit low for me. And when I went to the market, mostly I supply Sinves and there was also a feed maker in Porchestrum. I supply them with maize because I plant yellow maize. When I went to Sinves, my grade for maize, for some parts were grade B instead of A. Now that's when my price for maize decreased. I struggled to make profits. So with the type of rain, it was too much for me. I couldn't even access my farm. I had to go through another person's farm to get to my farm. That's how difficult it was for us. This year, we made sure that we open ways to let the water flow, but at the very same time to avoid soil erosion, to make sure that we have a good season, hopefully. With rain, we can never be certain because by the look of things, it's still coming and it's going to be excessive as this season. So hopefully we will be able to manage to plant the whole 200 hectares this year. From my side, I'm still going to continue planting maize, because, um, especially yellow maize, because that's what is needed to make feed mostly, especially animal feed. And also because I make my own feed at the farm, I cannot stop planting it. I'm a cattle farmer as well. So for me, maize is most important and it's a benefit as well for me. So hopefully with this year, everything will go better than this year. It cannot be greater because of the climate change, but hopefully it will be better. I think, Inelwa, you made a very important point. When you plant, when you harvest, it's changing. And maize is usually planted from October to December after enough rain has fallen, but now too much rain has fallen. What is the difference between the variation in planting time between the eastern and western production regions? Maybe you guys can just give some context to that. What is the best practice or advice that you have for farmers who would like to actually start growing this crop, maybe in this season or the next? Clifford, your advice? My advice, on is in agriculture, now it's costly for everyone. The input is too high. I'll advise every farmer, just don't go too big, go small and do everything proper. That's my advice. Because with this lot of money that we invest in, I never aligned with the people that said farming is a gamble. But now I'm starting to see that because we planned with hope that we're going to get rain. And then when the rain comes, it's too much. I can easily now break down for you, Don, to plant a hectare of maize, how much it will cost you. I'm sitting now this year, I'm going to plant 500 hectares of maize. At the cost of the fertilizer being plus or minus now over 8,000 to 14,000. And the herbicide being at 2,000 to 3,000. And the seed a hectare being 2,000. And the insurance in my area, because we only get hail twice in the eastern free state, the part where I am. Our insurance sitting at 900. And for mechanization, you use something 2.4 to 3.4. And the harvest cost at something like 1.3. For everything done, just for you to plant a hectare of maize now, it's sitting at 15,000. So I'm doing 500. So it's almost 15 times that 500. I'm going to have to try and make it perfect because it's a lot of investment that I'm doing myself. And remember, for me, I'm doing non-GMO with FarmSol, doing for AB InBev. I'm a producer for the AB InBev, the liquid, the castle and everything. And then I cannot expect to have season this year. Hence, I'm planning to do the NO3 gas so that I don't need time to go for top dressing because I couldn't put top dressing I had to now get drones and a lot of things I needed to involve this year. So for me, I'll go NO3 gas, put certain cages of fertilizer so that if it starts raining, I know everything is already there in the field. One of the most things in agriculture, it's your plant population because this thing of us done of this all planters that are planting are making gaps. It's costing us. Let me tell you something. You'll use 4,000 a hectare. Me decided to plant 30,000 seeds a hectare. And then the planter plants now 23,000 seeds a hectare. I'm losing 7,000 seeds a hectare. If I'll say I'm using 2 million to plant, and then I'm losing 700,000 of the land that has been prepared, worked, 
sprayed, fertilized, everything done, and there's no crop standing there. Last day I did all my planters, I went to precision planting so that I get every seed, every hectare, like pay what I set the planter to be. That's what assisted me because every year it will be like the harvester is looking for maize in the fields and that shouldn't be. I need a harvester when it gets there, it gets maize. My population, everything on a hectare should be hundreds because we are losing a lot of money with these gaps. I'm telling you, Don, it's a simple thing. If you plant a thousand hectares of maize and then you have gaps of 200 hectares, you are losing 1.6 million that you prepared and worked and did everything and attended every day. Thanks, Clifford. I think precision farming, precision irrigation, mechanization and using the right kind of mechanization is kind of trending at the moment, but putting that into practice and understanding it is something entirely different. And I think you're clarifying it for us very clearly. Um, Tabile, I see you have your hand raised. I also just might want to get Kenelwe and Tabo's take on what um, Clifford said, but maybe just your comments, Tabile. I've been listening to the farmers who are actually hands-on on this. They are right about a lot of things, be it to the too much rain and all that. But I mean, for this year, even though that it is anticipated, at least projected that we're going to get relatively good rains as well, as it was the case last year. But it looks like this year, at least, it may be a little bit lesser to what it was last year. And that, of course, would be a very good, I think, sort of a, an outcome for the farmers, of course. I mean, agriculture requires water, but too much of it, it does not assist. And I think, of course, maybe just for farmers that are not uh, relatively bigger in terms of scale, in terms of uh, like the risk that is going to be incurred and all that, it's, it's, um, it's even much better for them. I was uh, privileged enough, like uh, last week I was in Swaziland, I've managed to meet a lot of farmers there, both for, for grains, visited their grain belt. The good thing is that about Swaziland farmers, that they have relatively smaller farms, and also the rains they there receive tend to be similar to what we have here. So farmers are relatively doing well there. I spoke to some in Malawi. Malawi is another country that is a huge supply of maize within the Sadek region. So even farmers, that they, at one point they complained about drought. The situation with the rain is just too complex. Here, this part of the world, we are talking about too much excessive rains. But if I took to talk about the same situation in the U.S., farmers in the U.S. are switching off from maize to other crops that are not using a lot of, of soil, as farmers mentioned here. I think three days ago, farmers in, in European Union, they are moving away from the likes of wheat and maize to peas and other crops that are not consuming a lot of fertilizer. So, of course, the issue of, of inputs is a huge problem. But what I will say is this. It looks like we're not going to have enough maize this year, of course, given in the issue of Ukraine. So those that have managed to get something, it's very likely that, especially if they're going to go into the market at a relatively good quantity and all that, they're going to be in a position to do a bit of good. But of course, I'm not underplaying the issue of inputs. It's something that I think I was one of the very first analysts to mention that is going to be a problem. That was last year. We came in this year. It was actually what we were talking about earlier on. So I think for those farmers, they can just maybe try to be as careful in terms of not going too big. But of course, we are pessimistic about the weather. Hopefully, it's not going to be as bad as it was as the projections are pointing to that it's going to be a rainy season, but relatively lower to what it was uh, last year. Thanks, Tabile. You raised very specific points that you know farmers who is either starting out or newly commercialized farmers need to, to take into account. So thanks so much for that. I just want to maybe hear from Kenewe and Tabo again about the use of technology. I think Clifford mentioned that he had to opt for using drones instead in terms of his spraying. So is this where farmers are at at the moment, that this is the only way that you can farm these days? What are the some of the advice that you have? And guys, I've prepared very specific questions when it comes to the production side, but I think the conversation as an opener works just to get a broad understanding of it. And I think this can actually be a short series where we focus on maize because it's current season. So I will consider doing another session on this. Kenelwe, what's your take? Don, my take on technology is that it is important and it's helping us. Like Clifford mentioned, especially with drones, it came in hand for him because there was no way that he could go in with a sprayer. But with I managed to get in time with a sprayer. 
But at the very same time, we need to look at the amount of space or what commodity that we are working with in order for one to get a drone. Once you've made enough profit, then you can get a drone. Because also we need to consider the expenses that one has to, to have in order to buy a drone. We need to consider the amount of money. It's the same as security on a farm. One needs to have money to install a certain level of security in terms of camera and not so forth. So with me, you know, the amount of rain that I received this year, I had to improvise. I planted soya bean in between the maize. I've never done that before. I don't even know if, if it's, that's allowed or not, but I had to make a plan and it worked out very well for me. I was also confused, but I had to make a plan. And also we need to consider equipment. Equipment in farming is, is very important. The very same way technology is helping us. And especially if you are farming or planting on a larger scale, like Clifford said, when you are planting on a larger scale and you are losing too much. So when we were harvesting, I was on the harvester and in between, I could see how the rows were going. Some of them were curving, some of them were not straight. And you could imagine, Don, how much money one person is losing because of that. So when we plant, you set your tractor and you set your planter. Now, the problem is that sometimes you're not there or you're not on the tractor and they want to finish quickly. Now they change the speed of the tractor. So now that's when the problem happens. Sometimes the planter, it takes out a lot of seeds and then now you lose. So when I was planting on top of the harvest, I could see the way things are. I'm like, no, man, that, that's not how it's supposed to be. You know, the harvester can't be going after mealies. It is supposed to find mealies in that row, not to be skipping from one row and curving to another. You know, so we're losing a lot. But I do agree with Clifford saying that technology is very important and it is helping us. We are evolving as farmers. We are a different generation compared to what our parents used to farm with. Yes, their ways are still working for us, but we also need to improve. So that's where technology comes in. Thanks, Kenewe. And thank you so much for sharing that experience. And I hope that the farmers listening, that that was one takeaway as well, based on what you've just shared. Let's talk about this issue of fertilization. It's one of the biggest costs when it comes to maize production. Um, Tabile spoke about, you know, farmers rather opting out. But how does one really navigate it? A few weeks ago, we actually spoke about alternative ways to fertilize and what are the alternatives available and is it available for farmers who farm on a large scale? Um, Clifford, what is your advice? What is your best practice? And do you have anything to share to the farmers listening? With maize, every liter of water matters. When it comes to fertilizer, your tons is from fertilizer. The amount of fertilizer that you put in is the amount of the tons that you're going to receive. So let me tell you, you come and say you're going to put three bags of fertilizer on a maize, 150 kg. Let me tell you, you'll always be at the break even or so. For maize to make more tons, you need more fertilizer. And this starts from you need to do the best practice on your fields. It has to be soil sampling. It has to be knowing your pH and then fertilizing the correct field on the correct method because it doesn't help you come on the pH of two and then you put let's say five bags that won't get to the plant so the best farming practice will get you to the right thing I have shifted from when I took over my second generation farmer when I took over from my dad he was a confessional farmer he was plowing he was I came with I'm doing roll more I'm doing reaper and then i'm doing lime spreading every season and then i'm correcting my ph so that every fertilizer that i put down because we know the fertilizer is now expensive it will be like a dream people are starting to learn how important agriculture is we were buying our fish oil something two liter 40 rand 50 rand we are getting now our fish oil close to 100 rand. Everybody in the world now is starting to realize how important agriculture is. And with us, there's a lot of effort that we need to involve. I shifted on the minimum till because I'm trying to conserve every moisture from the rain. I'm in Senegal, it's a dry area. There's the heat wave here. There's, there's such a lot. And then I need to conserve every moisture that I get this side. I need to put much blanket on my soil. That's why 
you know, when I do, it's roll more in Africans. I don't know what to call it in English. I do that. All of the maize after the harvest lies there. I put a reaper. I put after that, let's say, my reaper has got the rollers, is doing now land prep as well. I'm taking less time on my fields so that I can be profitable. And remember, Don, a profitable business runs on a competitive entrepreneur. You need to do your things correctly because we are all aware now of uh, the cost is too high. We need to start saving in everything. I cannot come with a plow, come with sit bed, come with all of this. After I to shift my movement, what I do, it's a roll mode. I put a reaper. From a reaper, I put my planters because my reapers goes with a roll mode. The rollers at the back. And then I put a planter and then I do 100%. So we need to save as farmers because if we don't save, let's tell you, our farms are going to be taken away because we own banks, we take big loans. With farming, it's a lot of money involved. So if you don't do it correctly, you'll be out of the business in no time. In one season as a farmer, you can be a millionaire or you can be a millionaire. Yeah, that's so true. Clifford, and I think often, currently, it's so romanticized. We see the Twitter farmers, we see the TikTok farmers. It looks attractive. We have Grain SA's Farmer Development Lead with us in the space as well. I don't know, for some reason, I did not know his handle, but he is with us and he's also on my speaker list. Hopefully, we get to pick his brain for the last 15 minutes. And Dile, maybe just an introduction who you are, you know, what you do within the agricultural space, and then more about, you know, the commodity specifically and your experience specifically in your position as farmer development lead at Grain SA. I'm actually driving from uh, Lettenberg for a meeting with farmers, just finalizing last preparations for the season. As Grain South Africa, we support grain farmers, but not just grain farmers, because we are specifically interested in our members. So Clifford is actually one of uh, Grain SA's members. And I'm happy to hear the thinking from the farmer in terms of innovation. I think this season, as we had the conversation election work today, it's in the problem about the opportunity about climate change. It's to understand the fact that you've got a shifting climate or a climate that has shifted. But the problem we have with climate at the moment, it's climate variability. You just never know what's, what to expect. And I think that's a serious challenge for a lot of farmers. I want to agree with the notion that you've got to be extremely efficient. And unfortunately, some of the efficiencies that the commercial farming sector enjoys, you know, are not the kind of things that we as, as the emerging sector or developing sector can really enjoy. I mean, if you look at the costs that, that Clifford was talking about, he's talking about 15,000. And of course, there's already savings there from innovation, precision, alternative fertilizers. But there are places in our program, as part of the Mpumalanga and KZN areas, where we are sitting at 17, 19,000 hectares to plant maize per hectare. It's at the moment really looking unsustainable, but you don't have the luxury of fixing the price because if you fix it and you are unable to deliver those contracts, you also have a problem. But you also don't have the luxury of selling your maize at the best pricing opportunities in the year. Most commercial farmers they will hold on to that maize until they sell in January, in February, when there's absolutely no maize out there. And again, maybe the last one, when we talk technology, that kind of technology, and we saw it with our program, it's extremely expensive. If some farmers spraying with aeroplanes, but then you've got a queue of people waiting for aeroplane from contractors, and generally it's inaccessible to us as black farmers. So for me, my advice go back to lowering the amount of hectares that are going into production in the season. And you know, the nice thing about this new technology on harvesting, most of us know which are the best fields in our land. And for me, I would say, we focus on the best fields and we do the best we can from an efficiency perspective. And that's the only way we can survive. If you want to go the route of soil, which is less inputs, then you've got to be able to have a secured market in one way or the other. Otherwise, like Clifford said, the market may just be flooded in the coming season. So again, you don't have the luxury of quitting altogether because the season is a tough one. Many of the farmers 
utilize these different crops as a rotation crop. So you better find a, a, a crop that's capable of sustaining the business, even if it's about, you know, maintaining a break-even type of a budget just to survive the season. But to not plant, then you are in a new season with lands that were lying fallow. There's a little bit more cost to getting back that land back into production. But I think the farmers here clearly are pushing boundaries. I hear about intercropping with soya beans. And so it's quite exciting from an innovation perspective. But if you are a farmer and if you are us as Grenier say that land quite a lot of farmers through our partners to um, money through our partners to a lot of farmers, you have to be stressed if the performance of the season will be able to cover the loans and help farmers really sustain their businesses. Thanks, Andile. I really appreciate that you're here and you're able to give this broader perspective and also just commenting on the innovation from the farmers present. I always try to keep the speaker list dynamic in that way so that we can actually get all of these ideas coming to the fore and making it available to others who might not even be thinking about it. And I do agree that Kanoa's innovation is definitely one of those that I think, oh, wow, that's amazing. So thank you so much for your comments. We don't have a lot of time left, and I really wanted to get into pest management as well, because that is also part of a very important aspect when it comes to maize production. But like I said earlier, I think there should be an opportunity for us to maybe do a part two of the session, because I think we've just hit the surface and there's so much to talk about when it comes to the specific commodity. But I maybe want to focus on marketing. I think you touched on it briefly now as well, Sandile, and one of your former colleagues who is Ikacheng Maduleka. An agricultural economist as well, she advised that you have to be very specific when marketing this commodity. You know, in one of our Farmers Inside Track articles, she advised that farmers should think about cooperation silos, forward contracts, silo contracts, silo bags, and using maize as feed. And I think Inelwe said that she specifically plants it because she needs to feed her animals. Tabile, I want to bring you into the conversation again, just to talk about from an agricultural economist perspective, why is marketing this commodity? Why does it have to be so specific and why is this so important? The colleague from Grain SA will probably be in a, also in a better position with regards to this. First off, the market is a very competitive one. In generally, South Africa is a very small country in terms of its contribution to the global market in terms of supplying maize. So it's important one to know that even though you are doing good within the domestic market, but there is a bigger and the huge competition out there. So it's important that you, you get your story right in terms of what are you producing for? Is your market in place? If not, what is your plan? Because you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you have very good crop that you're not necessarily going to be in a position to sell because of a number of issues. I mean, the grain industry in general is very complex. If one does not understand it, it can be a very cruel one. I've managed to talk to some farmers uh, not so long ago, even despite the fact that we have for some percent good seasons in terms of farmers making money and selling. Some farmers were really disparate in terms of selling their product because they didn't have the, the right the right mindset and the right sort of ideas as to how to make sure that their product is going to get into the market, so, which is very sad when you see that uh, there is a lot happening in the market. A lot of people are making money at least, and then I said, hey, their product are secured in terms of their market, but one is sitting just somewhere there in the, he has no market to sell that. So I think it's very important. And of course, the colleagues um, from the Green SA and also the, the other colleagues that are within the Rostec space at, at large, if there's one thing about farmers is that they tend to you know, work very closely. They are family in, 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 in essence, so they tend to assist each other very well. So, But I think it's very important that for one, make sure that once he is to enter into a particular market, he gets his story right. It's important, I mean, to talk to folks. I mean, we have colleagues that are here that have been within this industry for some time. So they can be the reference point and then they can give farmers the, uh, you know, the right direction towards that. Thanks, Tabile. And maybe I want to bring, you know, Sandile back into the conversation just because I think you have so much to contribute in your position. Maybe just your take on this and also maybe more specifically advice for farmers. I think what Tabile said was so powerful. It is a very cruel space to be in if you don't understand it. So what is your advice? Like everybody keeps on saying, the problem right now that a lot of farmers are facing is crop grading. Maize grading at the moment is a big challenge. And in many cases, the grade twos and threes of maize that are dropped from one are really, in many cases, based on, well, the the size of, of the kernel. But on the grade twos, one of the issues is any spot on the maize 
may result in that sample being graded grade two. As Glenna say, this is something that we are really working on and really crossing fingers that we may have the revised grade regulations with the Department of Agriculture revised to allow a different way of looking at it. But of course, there are many stakeholders that are involved in this sector. On the one hand, you've got the off-takers that are, are, are looking at buying that maize as cheap as possible and possibly selling it at a better price. So for me, I think really the challenge here is if you are selling a big consignment of the crop or you are planting a lot of hectares, you are able to fix um, the price with some of your hectares. But the, the, the challenge is once you've got a contract on that crop, You've got to deliver on it because if you don't, any shortfalls, you will have to pay for those shortfalls because you are contracted to or obligated to deliver on, that, on those shortfalls. You almost want to create a buffer if you are a developing farmer. For me, the way I think we should be trying to manage is efficiency, particularly on the way we manage the process of harvesting. The more you leave the crop on the field, quicker that crop will deteriorate day by day. And we know in our country, not just you know normal factors of climate and, and pests are at play. There is also theft of the crop. That is a big issue. So you want to be almost precise with your harvesting time in terms of moisture content. Because anything, the more the maize dry, you lose out on weight, you lose out on income. Farmers like Pford and them are fortunate to have to planting on a contract you know, in terms of an offtake, but most farmers do not enjoy that. And so you almost want to manage the relationship before time in order to make it. So guys that are supporting some of the corporacies, you know, uh, delivering to some of the corporacies, my take is we really need to join hands in negotiating a better rate. We've been talking to guys from some company called MX Exchange that are really looking at linking maize from developing farmers with off-takers that are willing to push the boundaries on BE scoring and therefore prioritize buying maize from this kind of farmers we are talking to today. Across the board, you know, there is no straightforward solution. Like I say, as Greta say, you know, across the board, the commercial sector is dealing with serious problems on marketing, except they can push that price by locking it at the best time possible before planting or by waiting on the price until it really is at the highest. You can see now the, the price of maize at the moment is really still improving, but it's going to die very soon. And so it's a problem that we all are facing and we are all are trying to deal with. But I think with a smaller consignment, you may just be better off in terms of the kind of losses um, you may experience. But again, let's cross fingers on the grading regulations that may just allow a farmer or two to make decent income from what could have been this season, grade twos and threes. Yeah, all fingers and toes crossed at this point, Tandile. Thank you so much for your comments. We have a question here from Africa One Stop. Africa One Stop is asking, are there any local online platforms that grain farmers are currently using to establish demand during or after the planting season? I'm not sure who's able to respond to this one. Is there a platform, Sandile, Clifford, Tabile, are you aware of any platform that farmers can use? The guys I just spoke about now, MX Trade, working in that kind of space where they are matching demand and supply. And basically, they, they have a platform where, as a farmer, you can register your maize and say you are selling 100 hect- uh, tons of maize, uh, grade one, Senegal, and a matching off-taker could identify that consignment and make you an offer and you can negotiate on it. It's quite key farmers that we as Grain say we really use that data quite a lot, is the Crop Estimates Committee, who do from planting, well, they do from intentions to plant, where they understand what is expected to be planted in the season. And out of that, farmers can begin to negotiate their ways. And then at some point, there is actually planted hectares and eventually the estimates on yield. All of those are really about supply and demand. And of course, then export and import priorities are then determined from the output of the yield in that season. So I think your question is actually quite key from the guys online to say you've got to read as a farmer. And most farmers, unfortunately, do not read all of the stuff that gets put out there. So they just act on a neighbor and act on PSA. But there's quite a lot of evidence. And for us, we are saying if you're a black farmer trying to become commercial, You've got to plug in to the national system that works. If you try to start your own thing on the side, you are in trouble. Thanks, Andile. Clifford, what has your experience been? As farmers, we need to become accountable. Paying a levy at Grenisse 
gives you access to much of the information that you need to know what to plan the next season. When I started with Grand SA, it's years back, somewhere 2009, most of my ability and the knowledge I gained from Grand SA because every morning you paint that levy gives you much information every day from the Grand SA, this is the market parity, this is the crop the farmer needs to look at, this is what you should plant, you should not. And Grand SA will take you to all of these courses and sometimes people think it's small cost going there, but those things come in handy every day. For me, career-wise, I went for LLB and ambulance, what, 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 what. But from Grain SA, I've learned so much. They taught me so much that I need to know about the crop. And me sitting here today as a commercial farmer, I'm not afraid to say this. Grain SA made me. I think that's definitely music to Sandile's ears. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I think it's often overlooked. You can't just rely on maybe best practice of another farmer, but getting the more formal structures and stepping into the more organized agricultural sectors does have its benefits. So I think I think that's a very important point, Clifford. So thanks so much for that. Tabile, just your comments on, on everything that both Sandile and Clifford said, but more specifically, just as a final comment from your side. Just an in general comment for farmers, they can just, as I said earlier, just have some sort of a mentor that they can get into it. I think the guys that are here, they are telling their stories, particular farmers, in terms of where they, did this, where did they start all their journeys and all that. So I think it's important so that they can get the pointers. I think that will make it easier, but better than it would be if one was to trying to get in this journey all alone. So I think, yeah, that would be it for me. And and also thanks for the opportunity and also being part of uh, this conversation tonight. Thanks so much, Tabile. I'm not going to keep you guys much longer. I think I'm definitely going to create another session focusing on maize production and more of the aspects that we may not have covered this evening. Um, so thank you so much to my speakers, Sandile, Clifford, Dabile, Tabo, and Kenelwe. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much for being here. Everything of the best with your farming endeavors. May you just grow from strength to strength. Thank you so much. Bye for now.